here we are in the uh, Shenandoah National Park and we're about to start our very first the open booth yep and my first guest is we're gonna well come on in have a seat yep oh man Put on my microphone here. Hear me. Pardon me. All right, so here we are. Well, here we are. Here we are. This is the, uh, this booth is now taken. <laughs> but we're going to keep it an open booth. So, Jason Brown. Yep. No relation to Matthew Brown. And let's see, I'll start with a little bit of background, which is uh, I met Jason maybe about, what, two years ago now? Uh, yeah, it's been like two, two and a half, two maybe years. going on three. Yeah. At the uh, at our little men's group that yep. we have. Not at church or anything like that. Just nope. uh, where were we meeting? Starbucks? Yeah, Starbucks, uh, Panera been we've been meeting at a few places now going back and forth it was during the covid and all that stuff but we were still meeting right yeah were you at one point was, did we meet in a parking lot or something like that uh so that was still pre me okay. um i was coming to the group after kind of covid um opened back up and everybody was getting back out in the world yeah so um when i asked you to to be on my inaugural open booth you said you almost like i was like well you can pick any locations and you're like automatically like the mountains <laughs> yeah. i think it was just like knee-jerk reaction now like what was do you know why uh i just thought it was kind of a cool concept where you take literally a booth and you can just go anywhere in the world it takes you a little bit out of the office setting um because a lot of like podcasts they'll invite them to come to the special room where they just host everyone there and so with your little concept here, you can just kind of take your booth anywhere you want. And so I was like, well, why not take it into this beautiful view of the mountains that we get? So there you go. Only a couple of hours from Richmond, too. Yeah, not too bad at all. The home base for now, right? So you're 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 living in Midlothian, Virginia right now. Yep. And but you're not from Virginia originally. Nope. So I grew up in um, Kansas City, Kansas uh, my whole life. And uh, eventually left there when I joined the Army. I guess you were happy with the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> yeah, was, I've been pretty happy recently. Did, now, did you watch the game? I actually did not get to watch the game. Uh, so I was, I was in Peru on a uh, volunteer missions trip. And uh, I, got to do, I got to actually read a play-by-play -play of maybe like the last four minutes in regulation and overtime. So that was a, a different perspective on watching the game, but uh, I, I could have been a little delayed because I definitely saw something pop up on Facebook, but I swiped it away because <laughs> I was trying to just read the line for line. <laughs> I got you. Okay. <laughs> did you uh, did you have did you have any uh, regrets about doing that though, missing the Super Bowl? Absolutely not. Um, uh, just the this year's season, it was a little different and. I was. I kept saying I was like these towards the end of the season, or yeah, the last two games. The Chiefs they were just playing a different type of football than they had been playing in the regular season. So uh, I was like, these dudes are really gonna mess around and end up winning the Super Bowl after like the last two games of the regular season. And here we and here we are now, it's Super Bowl champs once again. It's there it's kind of crazy because uh, a lot of people don't even get to experience that um, with their favorite team in a lifetime at all. So take us back to Kansas City again. So you're mm -hmm. growing up in Kansas City. You're what age when you leave Kansas City? Oh man, uh, so this is uh, almost a year fully out of high school. So it actually kind of even goes a little bit further back than that. Um, my like, I think it was sophomore, junior year, I tried to like drop out of the school and I, I just really wanted to like join the army. I don't know what was calling me there. Um, I just always felt like this need for service, you know, so. Is that in your family? Um, mm. Both of my grandpas served in the Navy at one point, but it, I mean, 
it wasn't like a I like a family tradition or anything. I just felt like I this is something that I should be doing. So I don't know, some kind of higher calling purpose that maybe I didn't fully understand. Uh, but so I didn't end up actually f uh, failing out of school completely. My parents convinced me I should probably stay and, you know, finish high school at least, which I did. And then it kind of like fell to the wayside a little bit. Um, I probably was out of school for almost a year straight, uh, just working dead end jobs. And it just kind of felt dumb. Like, I was just like, what am I doing here? Like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not, I felt like, I felt like I had a purpose and I wasn't using it. And so I literally quit my job at like 4 a.m. Cause I was doing like an overnight shift, uh, and joined the service like that next morning when they opened up army yeah no. and then i i actually joined up with a friend um that i went to school with and it was like i think two three weeks um after we like signed our paperwork and we finally left and you tell your parents well yeah i told them okay. <laughs> they weren't too ecstatic but i was like this is something that i just want to do so did you talk it's, with them about it before you did it or you... not really no i just i kind of talked with them before you signed no oh okay yeah <laughs> i just was like this is something that i'm gonna do so you're 18 um, and you're like okay this is my choice now essentially yeah mm -hmm. it was i it didn't even take me back to the agreement i kind of had with them uh, finishing high school i just was like i this is something i need to do i just felt a, like a calling i guess to serve the country and I wanted to be in the infantry. I didn't want to be behind a desk. Like I wanted to be what down in the this? dirt. Oh man, I think. Or geopolitically, it... what was going on in the world? <laughs> I don't even know. You at don't that even point. know. Uh, I think it was 2008 because that was it was just over, about a year over of me graduating high school. So yeah, uh, and it was October, um, I believe, when I left out. Because I spent basic training in the winter time down in Georgia. So. Okay. My son was similar. He was uh, he was a band kid. Yeah. And uh, I didn't think there was much chance of him going to the military. But uh, <laughs> once senior year rolled around and uh, he had a couple of his friends that were interested in it. And so uh, I actually got him and kind of quote, booked him an appointment with a friend of mine who was uh, in the uh, Air Force guard and uh i like to tell this so he's he says to my son he's like there's you gotta think there's four branches really basically yeah you know army navy air force marines but don't think of it that way think of it as like where you sleep so marines you're gonna sleep in the dirt <laughs> army you might have a cot navy probably a bunk air force probably a three or four star hotel <laughs> yeah absolutely so, so my son chose the air force <laughs> it's pretty smart i didn't think about all that for sure i just, i don't know why i had this set goal of being in the infantry um but i'm glad i did it because it definitely gave me a sense of purpose direction like discipline in life um that i was definitely needing yeah now the um <clears throat> So fast forward, how long were you in the, the military? Uh, so I spent, oh man, it was, it was like six and a half years all in all, um, all active duty. Uh, and that includes um, time because uh, I spent just about two years up at Walter Reed um, when I got and You had a injured. relationship like that started during this. Oh yeah, so time. yeah, I was uh so I wasn't married when I went in. Um after my first deployment in 2010, 2011. Uh it was a year long deployment. I came back and came got back married. Kansas City. Yeah. I I got married pretty quickly. Um cuz you get R&R &R leave and it was I think so it was like about a, a high month. school sweetheart or somebody or something or just No, it was like a friend of a friend. Uh and uh you know, I trusted the friend that she was good people. And so uh, leave was ending short and I was like, well, what are we gonna do with this relationship? And so we just kind of flirted with the idea of 
I was like, well, you can come live where I am at in Kentucky. But I was like, we kind of need to get married in order to do that. So we ended up getting married right before my leave ended. And uh, so it was like two, three weeks that we knew each other to getting oh. married. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <clears throat> You want to delve any more into that or? Oh, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, so, I mean, it was obviously a shotgun wedding. Uh, didn't obviously pan out. <laughs> so going into my uh, second deployment, I found no, wait, out. Wait, wait. I want to clarify. Shotgun yeah. usually means somebody's pregnant. Like oh, well, yeah. Just not, nobody, not, not that kind of Nobody shotgun. was pregnant. Okay. Just, right. just a quick, <laughs> quick action. <laughs> okay marriage there <laughs> okay, my bad. All right, all right. <laughs> uh so yeah we ended up getting uh married and uh i think we spent about a year and a half um to almost two years together and i had a second deployment coming up and during the deployment uh, that's when i kind of found out she was unfaithful and so we uh we ended that um pretty quickly oh yeah now, like, uh, go back to your childhood again for a second. Like, church-going family, like, just kind of, like, Easter, Christmas, or just, like, you know, nothing like that, or just kind of, like, you know, gung-ho American, or what? <laughs> describe your family in, like, yeah, so, uh, terms like that. I grew up in a, a Catholic setting, um, and not to try and bash anybody in the Catholic world or anything, but it definitely felt very much uh, Christmas and Easter, um, were like the cool major holidays that everybody showed up for. Um, my mom always tried to like push me to go out on every Sunday. And I was always just like, I never really understood what was going on. It always felt like more of a tradition. Like, this is what we're doing. Now we need to get on our knees and now we need to stand up. And I had never even looked at a Bible before, never read scripture well, like on a grander level, like did you, did you ever, even at that age and maybe into, you know, going into battle and, you know, being in the military, did you even think about like God or higher thing or was that ever on the radar at all? Or Yeah, so I always had um, kind of like my own belief um, of what I, like my faith and I always thought there was some kind of higher power and just never never really understood um but i knew something was obviously in control um never like a universe's plan or anything like that it was always like i knew there was a god and that he was in control of the situation but i didn't know uh like the actual like scripture of him creating like the world and <laughs> it was just it was a very like emptiness faith on my end and I didn't know where to start looking, really. Just like a general belief that there's yeah, a God. Yeah, I just kind of was like, yeah, there's a God. I don't know what I need to do about this. <laughs> now, when you when you were in the, uh, in, in, you were married, was, um, was faith or church or God or anything part of that marriage or? Oh, no, absolutely not. Um, I mean, I never actually probably even knew her background on faith or her stance on faith um we married at a church or just like at the courthouse courthouse okay <laughs> yeah well i mean it was it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean anything if you get married in a church or a yeah. courthouse or something it's no yeah it was the, the marriage was anything. definitely a huge <laughs> huge mistake uh especially in the faith department <laughs> yeah now the um so tell me, was there any like really uh, time that uh, in, when you were serving in the military, anything significant happened? Like, were you, did you have any like things that you saw that changed your way you saw things or like, you know, the brutality or whatever? You know, is there some like standout moments that like really have changed you or galvanized your, the way you look at things? Um, man. I was, uh, especially just during the military time, um, as you see people that are like obviously getting killed, you always kind of wonder like what happens, you know, like you never really think about their beliefs, but you always kind of like think in the back of your mind, like what if that was me? Like what's going on? 
am I just gone? Like, is there this now purgatory? Am I just straight to hell because, you know, I'm here defending my country, just swearing and going out and partying when we can? Like, I mean, why don't you think heaven? Why don't you think because you're a good person, right? <laughs> you life. would like to think that, you know, everybody in the military is a good person, but a lot of us, even though we're serving the country, uh, we kind of feel like we're above the law a little bit. And that's just my kind of like personal experience I've had with a lot of people that I've seen in the military, at least on the grunt side, is they kind of just live every day as like that might be their last and just have fun with it, you know, like just drinking, doing whatever they kind of want. And that's obviously not the way we need to be living. A little bit self-destructive sometimes. Oh, yeah, 100%. And it kind of uh, just, it's it's understandable why uh, guys in the military kind of just have uh, <clears throat> like a desensitized way of living. Like, because they're just, with all the death and the desensitizing of training and fighting like an enemy like you kind of have or you've kind of been trained mentally just to think a little bit different so if it is like our last day you don't necessarily instantly think you're going to heaven because you've obviously just kind of been doing whatever you want to do your whole life and it may not necessarily be like the best thing for you yeah I mean, well, but you could say that about anybody. I mean, they're, well, yeah. I mean, even if they're not in the military, you're like, you know, I may be doing bad things, but, you know, I'm doing the best I can kind of thing in whatever situation it is. Right. Are you a little cold? <laughs> it's a little chilly. <laughs> that, wind, that wind just picked up <laughs> for a second. We are outside, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can't tell, we're outside. <laughs> it's not It's not green screen. It's not the, uh, it's not the metaverse here. Yeah. We're, we're, we're out here. I don't know what the temperature is. I mean, it's, it, but uh, the wind is blowing a couple times. So yeah. The um, so so tell me. So you're you went for your first deployment, um, and then the relationship fell apart. Kind of going into the second deployment, right? Yeah. So of... it was actually. Um, so I had deployed again, and is this uh, the third third deployment. No, this. Oh, so okay. I only had the two deployments. So okay. I deployed again. Um, ended up getting blown up in a suicide vest attack. Where was uh, that? It was in Afghanistan. Oh. Uh, so. So tell me the tell me if, it, if unless it's like painful. Tell me. No, like, no, no, we can talk. Tell me as much uh, details <laughs> about that day as you remember. Yeah. Who was so, with you? What your buddy? Whose buddies? I mean, what? Tell me about it. Tell yeah, me. yeah. So we were on a dismounted patrol. So we're walking around as us uh, light infantry grunts did. Um, and we're going down to this little town uh, that's right outside of our base, so not too far of a hike for us. Um, and so I, I was the first squad leader at the time, and so that just meant like my squad was in the lead. And so we walk in we to this meeting with the mayor. Uh, man, I don't even know how long we spent there. It felt like an hour at least uh, with our just commanding officer, just doing a meet and greet, seeing how we can like help the local populace, you know, tell them we're obviously here to help them, support them, because we don't want to fight the civilians, we want to fight the bad guys, right? So, uh, so probably... just because I'm interested in this, so tell me, like if you were there as a visitor, mm -hmm. would you say like this is a beautiful place, this is a dirty place, this is like describe it a little bit. <laughs> so like in not war, but just like you're there, like. Do you so, remember and like... Yeah, no. So it's honestly much like... Uh, my second deployment was much like this mountainous area right here. No trees. It's just like all desert. Um, but they do have uh, buildings that are made from this com like a concrete... Like a stucco uh, sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. They're pretty sturdy, but I mean, there's bullet holes on everything just from the years of war that this place has seen, even from like Russia back in the day. Uh trying to think there's uh there's not really like paved roads um not unless you get to like the main stretches of like highway like all the stuff inside the town it's all just dirt sand uh desert vibes um as you obviously get into the mountains a little bit rockier more kind of like this stuff just 
everywhere. Um, so you're in this village mm -hmm. and you're meeting with these leaders in a home or was it like a office type? Yeah, so it was, it's honestly just like um, like a city council building. Okay. So it's it has like multiple rooms, multiple stories. So it's probably one of the nicer buildings in the area. Um, no windows or anything. Uh, and they actually make um, anybody that goes into the room to talk to the elders and stuff. They like take their shoes off. Uh, our like captain at the time he like took his gear off to just be like more friendly and trusting like showing that he wants to trust them right um leaves his weapon with us outside so it was me and my uh, platoon sergeant and we had three of my people from my squad inside the building just doing like localized security inside um that's just in case anything were to ever like pop off inside the building. The rest of the platoon stayed outside and just did like perimeter security inside the little compound. So they it was like a they had like a giant concrete wall around the edge uh, of the building. So it was a nice little area, like five or six foot tall or something. Yeah, just like a normal kind of like a normal fence, even here in America. Right. Um, so these are kind of almost routine that you're doing these things. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. We always try uh, to meet with like the locals and stuff, um, just so that we have like that friendly presence with them. We like, like I said, we want to show that they're that we're there to help them, and that they want to. We want to get the bad guys away from them because the bad guys always just threaten the locals and they'll do whatever they want because they obviously don't want to die so right right so then continue so uh, what's going on next yep so uh <clears throat> meetings over with um so we start getting out of the building getting all of our stuff back on uh and again i'm still first squad so my squad leads out and then so the way you exit this place so there's a main road, there's this huge like drainage ditch, and then like a side road to basically walk into the compound. So we leave the main gate, you curve left to go on the side road, and then S back to get to the main road so that you don't have to walk through the drainage ditch because it's not really rainwater, it's more of sewage. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be stepping in that stuff. Um, and so as soon as my alpha team, which is the first team in my squad, as soon as like half of them got onto the main road, uh, a guy on a motorcycle drove up and just detonated on like one of my saw gunners, um, basically killing him instantly. And then when this he was a suicide bomber on yeah, a motorcycle. Yeah. And so he also had a bunch of like ball bearings, whether strapped to himself or the bomb itself had ball bearings in it. So those shot all over the place and just pierced like everyone. Uh, I think if there was like, if there was 25 people that were on that uh, mission, there was 24 of us that had some kind of injury from it because the, the shrapnel that just How went How far everywhere. away were you from the... I was probably about 10, no more than 15 feet away from the actual blast. And so when it went off, I remember, like, it just felt like your whole body just shook like an earthquake. And I kind of just... pressure wave from the explosion. Yeah. yeah. And so I kind of, I actually ended up getting, like, concussed. I kind of blacked out for a second, came to, I could still see, like, the cloud of dust. Like, it had just happened. Um, and I, I just obviously know, knew like something had happened. And so I'm like yelling for the guy that I see, like that's in front of me, I'm like, Hey, like Jesus, like come back. It was actually one of my, uh, so it was, <laughs> we had a Hispanic soldier with us at the time. His last name was Del Angel. And so everybody gets nicknamed. So we always called him Jesus, Okay. which is <laughs> just a, a funny side note. <laughs> Um, so I'm like literally yelling, Jesus, like, come back to me because he was closer to the road than when I was. And I could just tell he wasn't 
uh, wasn't doing great. And so I get up and get to him, roll him over, and actually see that it's my lieutenant, um, not Jesus. <laughs> and uh, so I, I mean, I could just tell he's instantly messed up. So I remember just screaming for uh, our platoon sergeant and the medic to like get to the front because those guys are usually in the rear. I'm like, we need help, basically. I drag him, I don't even know, maybe 20 feet or so to kind of like this little ditch that had like a little tree next to it um, just to get him back off the road because we never know if something else is coming in, you know, like right. they could easily try to pick us off with sniper fire, just dismounted gunfire, or it could be like another vehicle coming in to blow us up too, so... You never know the circumstances, so you always just want to try and back out for a second, gather your bearings so you can fight better. Um, so I'm dragging him back, and it's crazy, but, like, I know I'm, like, jacked full of adrenaline during this action, but I know, like, something, like, some kind of spirit of God or something helped me, like, pull this dude back because I remember someone being there with me. But, like, no one was there. It's so crazy. I don't know how to explain it. Um, but, yeah, I get him back. A medic or somebody arrives. I don't even know. I still have, like, some memory lapses and, like, who and what. Uh, but somebody gets there, starts taking care of him. And so I start going to the rest of my guys and just trying to make sure that they're okay. Um, carrying other dudes back, like... I, I know for a fact there was a dude that had a completely, like, shattered ankle, so I'm, like, basically kind of carrying him as he's, like, hopping around to get him back. Uh, I had another guy that we didn't obviously know his severity, but he had all kinds of just shrapnel that went straight through, like, his internal organs, his guts. If you like this video so far, please take a moment to subscribe, like, and hit the bell for notifications when new videos are uploaded. Uh, I remember like specifically this one guy who just had a lot of internal um, injuries from the shrapnel. Just him not even, he he didn't really obviously know what was going on, but he was just like, like Sarge, I'm not feeling right. And so I just remember helping him uh, and just taking him back. I'm like, yeah, you need to go get checked out, like... You never know the extent. I mean, at the time, we didn't really know, like, this guy had a bunch of metal ball bearings that just shot out at us, you know? It was just kind of like the shock of the whole thing that, like, yeah, we just got blown up on. And so you just want to make sure everyone's okay at that point. And, uh, <clears throat> during, uh, during, like, just my checks of getting the severely injured back to the not so severely injured checking those guys out um my school uh one of my team leaders i remember him and he's like hey man like you got hit and i was just like is it bleeding right now and he was like no nah, it doesn't look like it and i was like then you know we just need to move on because it's i'm obviously not <laughs> i'm not that injured right like i'll get to me when i can everyone else that's more injured needs to uh, be at the front of the line essentially so a triage kind of yeah so just me not really i don't know just not being i guess selfish in that moment you got uh, adrenaline going and everything else yeah just i was really just focused on looking after everybody everyone else you know i didn't really care too much about me i just knew my squad was in trouble and I mean, the platoon as a whole was obviously in trouble and injured, and I was just more focused on those guys. And uh, so, I mean, I, I eventually do get medevaced. I'm like one of the last ones to leave. Me and this guy uh, who I think just had a dislocated shoulder um, from the blast, I guess, knocking him back. Uh, we were like the last couple to leave. And I just remember on the, the helicopter ride, just like bawling my eyes out. Cause everything's kind of like wearing down. All the adrenaline just, it was nuts, man. Like, 
it could have been it could have felt like uh, everything that happened it felt like so quick but it could have been like an hour long whole process of from like when the bomb went off to me finally getting evacuated I really have no concept of how long the whole event was but it just felt like it was here and then over in an instant and I guess just like all the emotions of everything I just remember bawling my eyes out <laughs> yeah the whole way to back to like a bigger base and uh how many were injured during the I, I honestly I really don't know the number um like I said if there was if there was like 25 so it was my entire platoon of 20 plus people um with like a small headquarters element of like our like our commander um I don't think our first sergeant came out um but we had like a second med, uh, medic with us probably like an RTO so like a smaller five man unit on top of our 20 plus people so maybe close to 30 uh of Americans that we at least had um to include probably like one or two interpreters injured um I mean I really don't know mm -hmm. I just know it was there it was majority of the people that were out there that had some kind of injury anybody um, get killed during that yeah so we had my squad leader or not my squatter, I'm sorry, my saw gunner, who's the one that got detonated on, he uh, he had to be just KIA instantly as mm. soon as the blast. Like, he he was right on the road where, like, the bomb went off. And, uh, Was that somebody I, you were close to? Did you know him pretty well? Or? I mean, I knew him from his entire time being uh, stationed with us. So he was, I mean... You like to say you're friends with everyone, but obviously as a as his superior, I can't be like buddy buddy. But right. I mean, yeah, like it's somebody that I definitely had some kind of relationship with. You know, he wasn't just like a random uh, person. You know, so it's always it's all it's it's weird because it's like I am, I am and was friends with him, but I'm also his boss, so. It's right. even just right. like that work relationship. Like you have to have some kind of boundaries. You know, you can't be, right. You know, right. too close. Yeah. But uh, so we had him, and then the guy that I first came to, my lieutenant, ended up dying in surgery, um, from just from his wounds. Oh wow. Yeah. Now, what do you th what do you think was like? At you had mentioned it now twice, like about the fact that you were bawling. Yeah. Like what it what it just pure like tell me tell me about it i mean tell me what i mean uh, the biggest thing is i just i felt so i don't know with all the emotions of everything going on it was it was like happiness that it was all over with but just also like sad that like obviously that it happened and you know i didn't know like what was going on you know, or what was supposed to happen going forward, you know, like, you're just kind of in shock that it happened. Like, you, you can train for it as much as you want, but a suicide vest and getting shot at are two completely different things, in my opinion. Like, I can, I can be happily shot at all day. I spent, my first deployment was You can like be happily a, shot at? <laughs> yeah, my first deployment, it was like the wild, wild west, like... There was one day we had like 32 separate firefights in one day. Like that was, that felt like nothing, honestly. Like it was exciting. Like I was like, like, pumped. was this like literally with like bullets whizzing by your head? You oh, yeah. Hear bullets, them stuff? RPGs, like it, it's nuts. And that I'm completely like okay <clears throat> and fine with all of that when that happened. The suicide vest definitely, it, not to like, put a pun on it but it definitely hit different like i don't think i was ready i don't think anybody was ready for that honestly does it uh <clears throat> well so continue with the story though so you got you're on the helicopter yep so we get back to this um bigger fob so that we can all get checked out and i like i said i'm one of the last guys forward operating base yep uh, fob okay yeah. yep so i'm one of the last guys and they try and put me in a wheelchair just to like take me in i'm like come on guys like i i don't need a wheelchair like 
they're just trying to be accommodating because you never know people's injuries, whatever. I eventually sit down in it because they're just yelling at me, like, just to do it. I'm like, whatever. I don't, I don't care. Um, so they kind of separate us into different rooms. Um, I kind of explain like, Hey, I was told I got hit in the neck. Not really sure what's going on. Um, I also had like a small little piece of shrapnel go through like my right calf, which didn't even know at the time it had just like a small cut. What it wasn't bleeding anything crazy or anything like that. Um, but they basically just want to do a, a CT scan just to check over you. Because a lot of the big issues is like uh, traumatic brain injuries um, and concussions and stuff like that. So they're doing their scan, all the things. And uh, <laughs> they basically, the doctor comes in and kind of is just like, hey, we're going to put this, you know, C collar on your neck. And we don't really want you to, like, get up, move around, nothing like that. Like, I don't, I don't even know if it was a doctor, nurse, whoever came in and talked to me. Um, they said somebody would be back to explain everything that's kind of going on. And so now you, I'm like... You didn't even know why they were doing it. Yeah, now I'm kind of like, all right, like, if this is part of my head injury, that's fine. Like, I don't, I don't get it, but whatever. I'm just going to do what you're telling me to do. Right. And stay in this bed. And then so I eventually had, uh, I do remember it was some kind of officer. Um, I'm not sure his rank or whatever, but it was, it was a higher level guy. Uh, eventually came in and was just like, hey, like you have uh, like a metal ball that went into your neck, hit your C6 vertebrae, fractured it, and it's just sitting right there on your spine. And I'm like... All right, so I have like a broken neck. This is, <laughs> you know, this is wonderful. Um, obviously, didn't know it at the time when I'm like carrying these dudes around and trying to help them out. Uh, excuse me, just and they were obviously just like, don't, you know, you don't need to be moving around. Like we're gonna be sending you back, basically, home to like Walter Reed, so you can have surgery and you know heal up and stuff. And then uh, I remember just kind of sitting in like this room with a few of our other guys who were all kind of coming back to, for further treatment. And I just kind of like lost it again. I was like, dude, what is like, <laughs> what is going on? Like, I just, I didn't even know what to say. I was just like, I have a broken neck and now I'm just like, not even, not that I'm, not that I'm like being a burden, but I'm, I'm not even going to be able to go back to finish this fight with our, our guys now. Like I'm going home. And so uh, it was kind of like, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but it, like, like I was mad at myself them. and I was like disappointed that I like, that I got injured so bad that I have to go home now and I can't go back and fight again. So it was um, letting down your yeah. Your, I was like letting them troops. down. It felt mm -hmm. like so that was a struggle in its own world. Which sounds stupid that I got injured and I'm sad I got injured because now I can't go fight again. But <laughs> I have had no control over the situation. Yeah. So what was the extent of the injury? So uh, how much? What did you need? Like uh, you had surgery, therapy. What was it? Yeah. So. What, what uh, happened? Um, I ended up getting back to Walter Reed. Um, I think about two weeks, two weeks went by before I was even able to get in for surgery. Um, so I had surgery. They were able to remove the metal ball bearing. They let the bone heal itself. They so didn't where was it anything. on your body? If you point. So it's literally like right here. Um, you can probably, yeah, it's right there. It's where you can still kind of feel like the scar tissue inside my neck. Um, and it's obviously on the back side is where I had the surgery um, for them to pull it out. And like I said, they let the bone just heal itself. Uh, with no fusions or nothing like that. Um, so I spent like two, three months just kind of like in a sea collar recovering from surgery. It's kind of bedridden, which sucked. 
Uh, at Walter Reed? Yeah, I was at Walter Reed at the time up in D.C. For weeks? Or you said... Uh, it was like two months. Two months. Yeah, it was... They didn't want you to be walking around or you you up walking well, around? Well, it's because I was also with my brain injury and a traumatic brain injury. I was also a fall hazard. So oh. <laughs> if I would have fell with like a broken neck, like that would have just been like, who knows, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So I was kind of just like laying around in bed for most of the time uh, during that, that healing process before I could start like physical so therapy. So it wasn't really like bleeding like a lot? No, so I don't know if it was um, during like the, the ball fight. bearing, if it just kind of like cauterized it as it was going through, but I had no like blood flowing out of my neck. So missed arteries, missed, oh. missed all the things <laughs> and hit my, hit my spine and just stayed right there. It's practically a miracle, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. And then you, uh. The only other thing was the thing in the calf that got you. Yeah, I mean, that was that was so minimal at that point. Like, I didn't have any trouble, like, muscle-wise or walking other than just so my was there anything, balance and stuff off. anything good that came from your having to be in bed for two months or anything like that? <laughs> I mean, did you learn some things? I you... would like to say a lot of things happened, but I was also, at this point, going through a divorce. Um, so it was a... Uh, it was a lot of dark times for me at this point in my life. Like, uh, I was just feeling a lot of like guilt that I was back here in the States. Um, stealing a lot of depression and just not a lot of good things going through my mind. Um, How did that, uh, show itself? Your depression? How, how, how was it evident to you and to others or maybe around you? What, what were your indicators that you were feeling? Um, I, well, at first, I was just constantly angry at the world and just everything that kind of happened. Like, everything would just kind of set me off. Um, and even to the point where I'm just, like, crying for no reason. Like, even just thinking about what happened, I would just be brought to tears. Just me thinking about uh, not being able to go fight again. Just the unknown future, like what's happening after I recover, you know, am I going to ever fully recover? It was just a lot of like, what ifs that, um, I obviously didn't have answers for. Are you going to be able to play the piano again? <laughs> well, I've never played the piano <laughs> well, in general, word. but yeah, <laughs> just in general, like, you know, no. you, you, don't, you never know what's going to go on. So it was just kind of like literally everything in my day just would, kind of I'd be crying and just kind of being by myself didn't help anything because I didn't really have anyone to talk to other than my therapist who I didn't really want to talk to in general anyways right so yeah so what happened next um so I, I mean I obviously started like physical therapy uh I did a lot of just rehab in general um for my traumatic brain injury. At Walter Reed still? Yep. So, I, yeah, I spent two years at Walter Reed. Um, a lot of it was recovering. And then probably Did like... live there somehow? Yeah, How so they, they kind of have... Uh, housing? Like a sort of? housing, like a hotel on base. Oh. Um, where everyone that's injured kind of stays in. Did you get into... Did you develop relationships with like anybody there? Or like, you know, make friends with the... I don't know the staff or anybody. Um, so I ended up, I did have another guy, a soldier who was not under me, but in my platoon, who was injured in a second event that ended up being at Walter Reed um, probably about a month or two after I got injured. Um, and we ended up being able to stay in the same hotel room together. So it was like a two bedroom, kind of like apartment. Um, so that was cool to have at least a friendly face there. Um, but even then, like, I just felt still so alone and, like, distanced. And I kind of still had, like, this big Sarge mentality. And I really wasn't allowing myself to kind of, like, be be a good friend or, like, a, have a closer relationship with this guy. Um, just because he was, like, a private, which 
sounds stupid, but that's just how the military works. Like sergeants and privates can't really have like, or they shouldn't have those like friend type relationships, you know? And so I was also like, during most of my recovery time too, I'm like thinking that I'm coming back or like going back into being an infantryman again. Like I'm, I'm like doing whatever I can to try and like stay in and go fight another fight, you know? So how old were you at this point? Oh, see, I got injured in 2013. So that's 11 years ago now. So I was 23 at the time. Okay. So still, still pretty young. So the divorce has happened and you're still at Walter Reed mm -hmm. living on campus there, yep. getting the therapy, the not only physical therapy, but like yeah, physical, mental, psychological therapies. things like that. And so, what what else goes on? Is there? Are you still you you're feeling really lost? You're you're frustrated at yourself, the world, and all that stuff like that. Is there anything that else that happens that uh, takes you here to Richmond, or what? What what's what's the next step? Yeah, so um, part of my therapy was kind of getting back out into the world. And so I would start riding a train uh, or like the metro with one of my therapists um, just to like get back out and around people again because obviously kind of like a crowded room situation I was very uncomfortable with being, uh, being in. So uh, I just kept getting more and more involved in life outside and I ended up joining like this dating app uh met a few different people but then I ended up meeting uh, my current wife on this app and we just ended up um kind of hitting it off and I even joke around uh, but like I literally broke up with her at one point because I was like I literally just like got out of this serious relationship like I'm not trying to like rush into you know another another one you know right um but now when you met her were you still thinking you were gonna be back <laughs> in the whoop in the battle again uh probably yeah um so i mean i didn't i really didn't know what was happening but i think i was it was almost a year at being at walter reed is when i finally like met her um so i was still kind of like getting better but i still obviously wasn't fully recovered so but if you were I liking that i don't want to make the same exact mistake again kind yeah of thing. right i was trying to like learn from my lessons <laughs> <laughs> um but so i i didn't it's trying to i'm trying to remember specifically i don't think i could try and be in the infantry but i was still trying to like stay in the military like i was like well what else can i do you know like i'm not just broken like this broken person that's never gonna be able to work again um, but yeah, I ended up messing, uh, messaging her through the app and we got to dating for a little bit and then we ended up getting married like, I don't know, a month or so later. A it month. Felt, well, I, we, so we met in April and then we ended up getting married in like August, I believe. I can't remember. It's so bad. April. <laughs> my memory May, is so June, bad. June, July, August. That's <laughs> yeah. four months, but. <laughs> yeah. It might have been September. I really can't think of my anniversary date right now. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. We'll cut if this If my out. wife is watching this, please forgive me. <laughs> oh, this is so bad right now. Uh, I know it's the 29th, if that's even correct. <laughs> Do you know the year? Uh... We won't go there, I guess. Man, yeah, we have to move on. I'm sorry. This is so bad. I cannot remember it. And see, this is part of my struggles. I gotta I mean, write stuff down. You have the yeah. You have the uh, <laughs> the the app. You have the the. Uh, it's on the calendar. medical authorization I, yeah. to, to say you can. No. I could look it up right now, but I'm so in a hole right now. It's it's pretty bad. <laughs> so, did uh, did meeting her? Did you like, and then getting married so quickly did you have like was it a completely different feeling was it like was there like radar going up on you the whole time like i don't want to make the same mistakes i want to have the same kind of thing or tell me what was that all about and, um i don't know man it was 
I just felt like it was a good situation, you know, like I didn't know what I was getting into, but I, if I, so if I'm in something, then I'm in it like a hundred percent, you know, it's kind of like my service. So like, I didn't know exactly what I was doing when I signed up to serve, but I just felt like deep down inside, like this is, this is something that I needed to do. And with my, when it came to my new wife, like I truly like, really loved her and I like I could see myself being with her like it wasn't it wasn't like a second guess you know it was it was weird whereas like my first relationship I kind of was just being dumb and I was like yeah we can make it work it it def so it definitely felt different um and I don't know maybe what was she doing at the time what was her profession uh, at the time was I she think working? she was um she was like a, a nanny for a few families, which in the Sterling and Fairfax area, I'm, I'm sure there was a high need for it because they paid them pretty well. Um, and so she would just take care of kids while parents were at work. So they, uh, so you get married, you're still Walter Reed? Yep, and yes. And what happens next? Like fast forward, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we ended up being uh, pregnant with our, uh, our firstborn, um, Justin, uh, which she had actually a kid prior to um, me being involved, uh, Jacob, and so we became a, a small family pretty quick, because um, she was already pregnant before we even got married, and then uh, he ended up being born in March. His birthday is actually tomorrow, which is cool. Um, nine years old. Happy birthday. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're at this point still, uh, when, we're, when we're getting married, I'm, I'm starting my, like, retirement process. Like, I know that I'm no longer staying in. You know, my therapist actually kind of talked to me. and like, no, dude, like, you're getting out. You, like, this is this is the path you need to take. Like you're going to be getting like a disability check for the rest of your life. You'll still be able to work and stuff. So it kind of put a little spin on it instead of me trying to like stay in. I realized I was like, Oh, so I can't be in the military, but I can still like go work. So I was at least happy with that. Um, and then my son ended up being born in March And that's, like, also the same month that I, like, started my uh, retirement. So, like, him being born and me getting out of the military are, like, hand in hand. You're not even 30 years old and you're retiring. (laughs) Yeah. So it was a a cool concept, I guess, for a little bit. Um, I didn't work for a little bit. Kind of just soaked up family life with my newfound family. You know, two kids, wife. Uh, we lived, and we lived up in Sterling, so I was, um, I was still, like, working out a little bit, started doing CrossFit, um, while I was at Walter Reed, after I had done a lot of rehab, you know, physically, you know, I'd been medically cleared, uh, that my spine was, like, obviously healed and all that stuff, so, started working out, and then I kind of fell in love with CrossFit, and ended up coaching up. Uh, coaching at a CrossFit gym for a little bit, so that was cool. And then I ended up getting this, uh, found this job opportunity in Richmond, uh, full-time CrossFit coach. And so that's kind of like what brought us down to Richmond. Kind of packed up and found a home and started working. If you like this video so far, please take a moment to subscribe like, and hit the bell for notifications when new videos are uploaded. You had just moved to Richmond. Mm-hmm. And so, so at this point, it's uh, your family moving to Richmond. Yeah. You know, so it's your wife, your son, and yourself, of course. Yeah, yeah it's our two kids. And... I think we were pregnant with our third Savannah at that at this point as well, so we were quickly growing. Pets. 
Uh, no pets. Okay. No. All no right. pets. That makes the move easier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a big thing because, like, I've traveled and done things with pets, and like, oh, especially if you have a cat. Oh. Yeah. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to have to move if you have a cat. Yeah. Yeah. You know, dogs are all right most of the time. Yeah. Our dog is good now. She does pretty well on travel. Yep. So now you probably, I don't know if I picked up on anything there, but I'll try to plug this in this time. So. All right. Here we go. Now I'm back on track again. Moved to Richmond and made the move with the two kids, and you even had one in the oven. Yep. Savannah. Uh, I think she was she was cooking with no pets. <laughs> no pets. So tell me tell me about the move to Richmond. Was that a, was that a good thing? Oh yeah. Um, so uh, like I said, I moved down here for a job opportunity uh, to start coaching CrossFit, and uh, I mean that didn't really pan out too too well. Um, but at least it, it brought us down here. Um, it definitely created more opportunities and that's honestly where, so my wife, um, so she had grown up in the church, uh, not in a Catholic setting. And so she, uh, she ended up shopping around in churches to find, uh, kind of a home for us. And I was kind of on the fence about it. I was like, I don't know, like church growing up just really rubbed me the wrong way. So I really wasn't sure what was going on. And that's something that I didn't have in my previous relationship. Like, we never really talked about going to church or faith or anything like that. So I kind of let my wife just, like, take the steering wheel um, for this uh, at this point. And so she ended up finding um, Swift Creek Baptist for us. Uh, and, you know, we spent... Is that the only church you visited, or did you visit some others? I think this is that's the only church I actually went to. She went to oh, probably a handful okay. of others, um, but for some reason she fell in love uh, with this one. So I was like, cool, I guess I can tag along, you know. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, yeah, so we, man, we spent at least like, five to seven years at this place just kind of showing up every Sunday I mean not even every Sunday just when we could make it just listen to the message and just saying hi to familiar faces but not really getting connected or anything and I mean, then but did you feel like you needed to do something? Like, did you feel like, I mean, you said that, you know, in the past you had felt like you, you thought there was some kind of God that had some kind of path maybe or something, but like when you were there at the church and you were hanging out and, you know, listening to the message and stuff, was it ever like anything that was even interesting? Or was it just kind of like you were doing it because your wife wanted you to do it? Um, I, it definitely started off like that. I was, I was just here, of like, because I'm just trying to, you know, support my wife. She wants us to be in church, so here I am, like, I'm in church, right? And I would listen to messages, and nothing really kind of hit home. Um, uh, there, and then there's this one uh, Pastor Brian did. It was like a checklist Christianity kind of vibe. And it was like, you're just checking the block. You're not actually, like you know, living out in your faith or anything like that. And it was just like, yeah, we show up, but we're not really doing anything else as a Christ follower. So uh, I think that that message honestly probably hit me the most out of anything. And then COVID hit and we kind of, uh, obviously everything got shut down and we kind of got into some bad ways where we were just kind of, just living a party life because um, there's nothing else to do. And so we just... Wait, so you had kid, kids, three kids. Yeah. And you and your wife, obviously. But you're partying. What is partying to you uh, with so three kids? So we were just out just drinking and doing a lot of uh, dumb activities with some friends. Um, and just not really caring about what anyone thought of us or what we look like in the public view or 
if this was even our appropriate way to live. Like, we just, we were just living in the moment, you know? And so... That just sounds very judgmental, though. <laughs> You're judging yourself. 100%. <laughs> now I am. I 100% am judging myself for my past actions, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, there just became a time where I just kind of felt convicted. And was like, this is not a way that we need to be living and bringing up our kids. And we just, uh, we got back into church when things started opening up and really just started talking to the pastors. Um, I know specifically I sat down with, um, pastor Mark and, you know, he shared the gospel with me. He was just like, and I had a lot of questions for him. I'm sure where I was just like, why would God want me? Like, I'm just this broken person who's done nothing but lived in sin. And I didn't understand why, you know, God would just think that's acceptable, you know. And he just kind of flat out told me, he was like, well, God wants everyone. It's just whether you choose to accept him or not, essentially. And so I just was like, well, what do I need to do with that? <laughs> So I, I, you know, I accepted Christ into my life and he's, I understand like everything that's kind of like brought me to this point is just kind of like my testimony and like how, you know, it's, it's just been God's plan and will all along. Like, and it's, it's a crazy journey that I've been on, but I wouldn't trade it for anything now. So I want to rewind what you said there for just a second and mm -hmm. ask you a question. So, was there, like, you said he shared the gospel with you. Yeah. What does that mean? What, what, I mean, I, I hear those words sometimes, and yeah. people hear those words. Now, when you, what does it mean? What, is, what does that mean? What are those words, what does that mean to you? What is it? Yeah, so, I mean, the, I mean, a short story in the gospel, like, Jesus came, lived as man, while still being fully God, he came on this earth uh, and died for the sins of the world, all of our sins. And then conquered death by being uh, risen three days later and then eventually ascended into heaven. And for him to take on the world's sin and punishment, um, I mean, that's just... It's, it might sound bad, but that's just an insane task that only, you know, like a superior being would sign up for, you know, like I, I, I can't even put it into words right now. Like somebody like that's, that's completely being unselfish, you know, somebody that created us and then still is willing to die for us so that we can find a better life in him. Like that's, I don't know, that's a beautiful picture in my eyes. A lot better than this view, and this view is pretty beautiful. Were you? Uh, did you feel like when he, during this period of time, that when you felt God was talking <clears throat> to you, was there something that was like, how do I say, like uh, where you felt? like convicted of like your or was it more like uh was it the love that drew you or is it the conviction of the past or was it some kind of both or tell me tell me what was the overwhelming yeah, no, so uh a lot of it was just um like the immediate love that i felt and like the purpose that i felt of me being here you know like he could easily killed me off like, so long ago, like, in high school, whatever, like, I could have not had any kind of life or relationship with Christ at all. And or so... in Afghanistan. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, all the all the sinful things I've done in my life, like, I don't, I don't necessarily deserve to be here, but you know what? I still am here, and I'm still finding a purpose for why I'm here, and I'm trying to use, um, you know, my purpose through Christ and just spread, you know, the word to people that don't have it essentially. So the biggest thing for me, um, 
is, and this is something that really hit home is something that I struggled with for a long time in my depression is I dealt with suicide for a solid seven years. And, you know, I never actually tried to, you know, take my life, but I literally had some, you know, some just demon thoughts, just like, I don't need to be here. Like I should just end it. Like just, it was brutal for seven years. And I remember crying on the couch one night, um, just to my wife and this is in our new house. And I was just like, I, I just want it to stop. Like the, the voices in my head, it was just, it was something that I really struggled with that I didn't know how to get it to stop. And then this was all before, uh, I started talking with Pastor Mark and just learning more about Christ and the gospel. Um, and then I can fully say like that from that day when I accepted Christ into my life, I never had another like single suicidal thought or any kind of craziness like that. So whether I have some crazy, I don't know, miracle happen now or not, I don't need to know, or I don't know how to explain it. I don't, I don't need something new in my life to know that God's still with me. Cause I know that that happened and I'm living in it now. Like I know Christ is here. Like he's in me. Yeah. Now you said something a moment ago is like, you knew you had purpose. A lot of people like, you know, will go through their life, like feeling purposeless, you know? And I think it probably in some ways you said when you were, uh, when you were in that, uh, Walter Reed and, you know, you, you wanted to be back in the battle, you know, you, that was the whole thing. You're like, you didn't have a purpose. And there's probably lots of people who like, don't feel like, you know, like maybe it's their job, it's their purpose, but they lose their job. And maybe it's their children that, you know, but then their children move away and it's their relationship. They, but that doesn't work out or something, or the spouse dies or, you know, they get divorced or something. No. What's the purpose then? What do you feel is like the overwhelming purpose? Yeah, I mean, so I and I may not never know my true full purpose right now, but I know God calls us to love him and to obey him. And so if you can do that, he then calls you to share this same exact love and relationship that you have with Christ with others. So event that's the ultimate purpose in life is just to continue to spread the word and share the gospel and just find more believers. And so even if you never have, a, I don't know, the exact way or purpose that this needs to be done, just sitting down and having a conversation with somebody and explaining what the gospel is, that's, that's part of that purpose. So, Yeah. And now do, do you feel as a, obviously as a husband, father, that, uh, that like is really home, hits home? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And I, so I, I still struggle, um, talking with my kids about, you know, their, you know, purpose and love with Christ, but that's just cause I feel like they're young and I, like, I don't want to force it on them. Like I kind of felt like. Um, church was forced on me at a young age. Like, I don't want them to, you know, resent going, you know? So I'm kind of hoping, I'm, I'm always there ready to talk with them. Um, but I also want them to develop their own want and love and relationship with Christ. I don't want me to force the relationship with Christ, you know? Like, it, it shouldn't be forced. It should be something that you want on your own. Well, isn't it kind of like the way you just said that, though? Isn't that like kind of like the doorway, which is it's not forcing them to go to a place. It's inviting them into that relationship. Absolutely. And I mean, I don't know, you know, we haven't talked about specifically, but, you know, if you have a quiet time, then inviting them into that quiet time and, you know, a prayer with you that, you know, that they can share in. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe daily, weekly, whatever you want to do just to get started on that kind of thing is uh, inviting them into a relationship, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's going to have to eventually decide on their own Mm -hmm. to stay in that relationship or to, you know, 
um, make that uh, relationship uh, real. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, it's, I personally cannot save anyone. So like as much as I want my family or, you know, my neighbor, whoever it is, as much as I may want them to be saved, I can only give them the information and it's up to them and Christ who can ultimately save them. If they never accept Christ, then it sucks. But that's, you know, that's their decision at the end of the day. Even if they reject Christ, you're still going to love them. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Your friend, your neighbor, your children, of course, your yeah. spouse. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful day, and I appreciate your coming to the open booth. We'll have to leave it open here for, in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. And, Maybe we uh, can get my wife out here, cause, and she can tell you our anniversary is August 22nd, <laughs> 2014. <laughs> Good comeback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for tuning in to the open booth, and uh, we'll see you next time. We're going we're gonna to leave it open here. So... <laughs> Thank you for visiting the open booth. If you like this video, please consider sharing it.